Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. We just would like to welcome our e-learning students as well, and our online students and our in-person students. So welcome, everyone. Uh, hope all of you had a good uh, weekend and uh, you know are all ready to face another new week. Uh, this morning, we'll begin our study on the book of Titus, Paul's uh, Epistles letter to uh, Titus, who was overseeing the churches at Crete. Uh, before we look at um, Titus, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. So, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? May I ask Christopher to lead us in prayer, please? Ah, uh, yes, Pastor. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for all the things you did for us. We thank you for this for the weekend that we just had. Thank you for having getting us refreshed for, for the new week. We thank you for Pastor. We ask you to give our inspiration to teach us and to be able to, for, uh, to impart all the good messages that come out of uh, the, the Bible reading. And uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for looking after us us in good health, keeping us safe from harm, and um, giving us everything that 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 we need. Uh, we ask you to uh, continue to bless us, give us all your grace and mercies, and um, be with us uh, throughout this class and throughout the day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Christopher. Um, so today, this morning, we're going to be looking and studying uh, the book of Titus, Paul's uh, epistle, his letter to Titus. I have uh, posted the PDF uh, copy of the introduction and chapter one. Uh, now, I have written uh, uh, all of it out, uh, the research, the study that I have done. So it's a very detailed uh, study, which means I'll be teaching or speaking exactly from the notes. So please don't think that I'm just reading out of the notes, but it's basically what I have studied, what I have uh, researched, what I have um, uh, learned, I just put here. So there's nothing more that I need to add additionally because I've just written this whole thing out. Uh, so please don't think that I'm just, you know, reading it out of uh, uh, the, the course content. It's basically that I've written out everything I've researched. So there's nothing extra that I need to uh, add. So you can just follow through with the uh, with the notes and if you have any questions uh, you can ask. So we look at uh, the introduction to uh, Titus, uh, the book of Titus. Now we know that um, uh, you know uh, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus and Philemon uh, are considered as personal letters of Paul because he's personally writing it to uh, different individuals. He's addressing these letters to different individuals. Uh, so it is uh, called as the personal letters of Paul, but it's also generally being called as the pastoral epistles because um, though these are very personal letters addressed to specific individuals, uh, they are not limited to just personal and private uh, communication. Uh, it is uh, also has a, a, a component of something that is more official in character. Uh, these letters, because in these letters, he is basically uh, addressing the various concerns in the churches at Ephesus, at Crete. Um, uh, and so, you know, um, these uh, are also called as pastoral epistles because uh, he's guiding uh, Timothy and, uh, 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 and Titus in matters concerning the pastoral care of uh, the church. Uh, and hence, uh, these are letters that uh, are called personal letters, but also they are called as the pastoral epistles of Apostle Paul. And these books, uh, First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus, are pastoral in nature because they give directions. They give directions on how to deal with uh, false teachers. Uh, how to uh, you know build up the church, uh, the the saints in the church, the believers in the church, uh, regarding faith, uh, holiness, godliness, uh, and also how to establish leadership in the local churches. We saw that in uh, his letter to Timothy, and we'll see that again in his letter to uh, 
Titus. Okay, so that is why this is uh, also called as the pastoral epistles of Paul, First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus, all pastoral uh, epistles. Now, who wrote uh, this letter to uh, Titus? The the uh, the letter itself or the book of Titus itself uh, claims to have been written by Paul. It's mentioned there that Paul himself is writing uh, this letter. So we can surely say that the author of this letter is Apostle uh, Paul. Now, who is Titus? Uh, Titus is a, a, a Greek-speaking Gentile who is a, a believer who was converted by Paul either in Antioch when um, you know Paul spent considerable amount of time in Antioch, a good amount of time, uh, a, a couple of years before his first missionary journey. So they say that um, Paul would have uh, met Titus during this time, and uh, you know he um, uh, Paul converted Titus uh, in Antioch. Or it could also be during his first missionary journey when Paul was in uh, in Galatia or Pamphylia, which is in uh, 47 or 48 AD. Uh, so how, what do we know about Titus? Um, we don't know anything much about Titus, but from the scripture, what we know is that, uh, you know, Paul takes him along with him uh, to the uh, council um, of um, of Jerusalem. We read this in Acts chapter 15, verses 1 to 21, where Paul takes uh, Titus because, um, you know, he wanted to ask the leaders that those who were non-Jews, uh, Gentiles, uh, converts, uh, should they uh, be circumcised? Is circumcision a requirement? And we know that uh, Paul uh, spoke uh, against this, that, you know, that it's not mandatory that the Gentiles uh, need to be circumcised. And so the leaders at the Council uh, of Jerusalem, they agreed with Paul and they hence uh, did not insist uh, that Titus should be uh, circumcised. Now, from Paul's various other epistles and letters, we also get a little bit of information about uh, Titus's uh, character, his personality, and his relationship uh, with uh, Paul. So uh, from this letter itself, in Titus chapter 1, verse 4, uh, you know, Paul writes and says, Titus is true son in our common uh, faith. So just like um, uh, you know, Paul looked at Timothy as his son in the faith, as somebody who he brought to the faith, somebody who nurtured, uh, somebody who he strengthened, was a mentor. The same way we see that uh, Paul also looked at Titus as his son who he uh, brought into the faith, uh, who he helped uh, to have a salvation experience and also mentored him, taught him and brought him to a stage where he could be a good leader, take on leadership responsibilities, and oversee the churches at uh, Crete. Uh, now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, uh, you know, Titus uh, is written there as Titus was a genuine brother to the apostle Paul. Uh, so we see that Paul not only just looks at him as his son, but now he's grown to a stage where he can become a co-worker, uh, a co-laborer and also a fellow believer, a fellow brother in the uh, faith. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23, we read that Titus was a partner, fellow worker uh, with Paul. In Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, we, uh, we read there that Titus walked in the same spirit uh, as Paul. Uh, in the same um, uh, book and the same chapter and verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 18, uh, we also read that Titus walked in the same steps as Paul in the same manner of life. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 7, we see that Titus, uh, you know, uh, could be a pattern for other believers. Uh, his life, uh, his way of living, you know, could be, uh, be a good pattern, a good model, a good example for others to uh, follow. Now, something wonderful that we can uh, look at Paul's association uh, with uh, various people that he has brought to the faith, uh, who he mentors, is that he does not just 
keep them as sons under his jurisdiction, under his control, under his dominion. Uh, but look at how he, you know, he nurtures them from uh, being a son in the faith to growing up to be somebody who is a brother uh, and also somebody who becomes a fellow laborer, fellow co-worker, um, who also, you know, uh, is uh, come to a stage where they're mature in their faith walk, uh, in their um, in their uh, uh, in their relationship with uh, with God, their walk in the spirit, uh, you know, and their manner of life is just the way that uh, Paul lives. So it's it's so important for us to learn how to be good mentors uh, or or people uh, uh, leaders in the faith. Uh, as looking at uh, Paul as an example, you know, he just not does not keep them as sons under his control and always tells them what they should be doing, what they should not be doing, uh, exercising his control. But, you know, he brings them to a level where uh, they are mature in their faith, in their uh, in, in their understanding of the doctrines, uh, in their walk to be Christ-like, to be holy. And then he just releases them uh, to to do the work of the gospel and then he brings them to a level where they are you know the same level as he is which does not threaten him as a leader as an apostle uh, somebody who has uh, nurtured their faith he's not threatened by them growing or threatened by them becoming leaders or threatened by them overtaking Paul uh, which is a good example for us to you know uh, basically learn from uh, Paul's uh, way of life. So even as, uh, you know, we all of us grow to be leaders, somebody who will mentor other people, this is a good model to follow from uh, Paul's uh, uh, life. Okay, so we see that, uh, you know, Titus moved on to from being a son uh, who was nurtured by Paul to become one of Paul's most closest and trusted co-workers, just like Timothy. Uh, and uh, how do we know this? Because, you know, he entrusts um, Titus with this whole responsibility of looking after the churches uh, or overseeing the churches, uh, specifically those churches that are going through a lot of uh, uh, disturbance that is in Corinth and in uh, Crete. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Titus uh, helped Paul at Ephesus uh, during his third missionary journey, and then he was sent from there to Corinth, uh, where, where Paul sends his first letter of, uh, you know, the first uh, the letter of uh, Corinthians to the church at Corinth, and he sends Titus with this letter. So Titus goes to Corinth, he gives them the letter, he stays there, oversees the work for some time, and then he takes back news about how the church at Corinth is doing back to Paul, uh, where Paul was at Philippi. And then, you know, uh, Paul, uh, based on all the information that he's heard from various sources about the church at Corinth, after he's sent that first letter of uh, 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 to the church at Corinth through Titus, and also getting a feedback about how things were, the improvements, areas where changes have to take place from Titus himself, you know, he writes uh, the second letter of Corinth uh, uh, to the church at Corinth, that is uh, the second Corinthians. Uh, and then he sends uh, the letter again with Titus, uh, and Titus carries the second letter of, uh, 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 to the church at Corinth. And, uh, you know, he also uh, is instrumental in uh, collecting money uh, from the church uh, at Corinth for the poor saints in Jerusalem. We read about this in uh, Second Corinthians. So if you look at your notes, you know, um, uh, uh, Titus carrying the first letter of Corinthians, second letter of Corinthians, and also helping with collection of money for the poor saints in Jerusalem is all the, uh, you know, uh, the references are given in Second Corinthians chapter 12, 7, uh, and chapter 2, and chapter 8. So all the references are there. You can look it up later on and um, read. Now, after Paul was released from his uh, first Roman imprisonment, which was a house arrest, you know, um, uh, Paul uh, travels to Crete where he takes Titus along with him. And at uh, Crete, they 
you know, they, they uh, 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 preach and teach the gospel. Uh, they also send, strengthen the churches at Crete. They establish, they establish church, uh, churches at Crete. Um, and then, you know, uh, Paul feels the need that, you know, the people at Crete, the church at Crete, or the churches at Crete need some more uh, support and help uh, to organize things, um, you know, uh, to make uh, things much more smoother uh, uh, at the churches at Crete. Basically, you know, there was uh, the same problem that, um, uh, you know, uh, was at Ephesus. The, uh, the reason why Paul leaves Timothy there was because of, um, uh, you know, the false teachers that were creating a lot of uh, disturbance and uh, chaos uh, in the churches at Ephesus. The same problem existed at Crete as well. Uh, the false teachers there, the Hellenistic Jews, uh, who were creating a lot of issues, a lot of wrong teachings, bringing a lot of uh, uh, ritualistic, Jewish ritualistic, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, rituals that they, they were trying to spread about, and uh, Jewish fables, which was causing a lot of confusion. And also like the churches at Ephesus where they needed good leaders uh, to carry on the work there. Uh, so Paul writing elaborately about how to choose, uh, you know, uh, leaders, deacons, bishops. Uh, so uh, we we saw that in uh, his letter to Timothy. The same thing he writes again to um, uh, Titus who is at Crete. So uh, these are the reasons why he feels the need uh, to leave uh, Titus behind um, and Paul continues on his journey and Titus was left at Crete uh, to oversee the work there um, and also, you know, um, uh, to establish good leaders in the church and also teach the truth that can defend uh, the false teachings that were there uh, because of the Hellenistic uh, Jews, okay? Uh, so we see that, you know, when uh, Titus was at Crete, uh, uh, when Paul writes this letter to him, uh, he tells uh, Titus to come and join him at Nicopolis. Uh, so when uh, Titus leaves Crete, uh, Artemius or Tychicus, you know, they take on the work at Crete. This is, uh, you know, they, uh, Paul sends the letters uh, of Titus to uh, uh, Titus, who is at Crete, to these people. So when Titus was, uh, uh, you know, Crete, they come, uh, they give this letter to uh, Titus, uh, and then he goes uh, to, to Nicopolis, where he joins um, Paul and Tychicus uh, and Artemis, you know, one of the two, they take over the responsibility of the church at Crete. And then we see that... Um, when Titus was at Nicopolis, you know, Paul commissions him for an evangelistic work, work in Dalmatia. And uh, later on, tradition says that, you know, Titus goes back to Crete uh, and, you know, the traditions describe him as a bishop there uh, till his old age. So maybe he's, uh, you know, he's so burdened by uh, uh, Crete or he loves the place. Uh, he loves the people there. So even though he had other uh, missionary assignments um, in different places, Nicopolis, Dalmatia, uh, but he goes back to Crete, uh, becomes the bishop there, that oversees the churches and continues uh, the work at Crete uh, till his old age. Now about Crete, uh, Crete is one of uh, the largest, one of the largest islands in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, you know, the Cretan people had a very disgraceful and a bad reputation in the Roman world. Uh, one of their poets, uh, Epimendus, uh, you know, uh, who Paul quotes in his letter uh, in chapter 1, verse 12, uh, where Epimendus, this, like, he was like a prophet and, you know, a poet uh, uh, and uh, somebody who was held in high regard by the Cretans. Uh, and he says that Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So this was the general view of, um, uh, you know, the people had about Cretans or about the people at um, uh, Crete. So they were quite notorious people, and uh, it was uh, added more a challenging role for uh, Titus because 
you know of their um, of their uh, uh, reputation that they already had as uh, people who were liars evil beasts and uh, lazy gluttons now how did uh, you know how were the churches established in crete how did the gospel reach crete uh, it was not only when paul and Titus went to Crete after Paul's um, first uh, Roman imprisonment, but uh, the churches, uh, their churches had been already established in uh, this island of Crete. And they say that it was most likely uh, when, um, you know, during the time of Pentecost, when um, uh, there were Jewish Hellenistic Jews who had, uh, who were in living in Crete, you know, we know that during Pentecost, all from Jews from all over the world come to uh, Jerusalem to celebrate the uh, the, uh, the Pentecost. And uh, so, on the day of Pentecost, you know, uh, there were Cretans also who hear this uh, mighty rushing wind, and they came to that room where the uh, the the uh, 120 disciples had gathered, and they were all speaking in tongues. Because it says, you know, the Crete in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 11, if you read, says the Cretans and the Arabs, they heard uh, the, 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 these men, men of Galilee speaking uh, praises and worshipping God in their own language. So it's most likely that, you know, even as they were standing there, uh, they heard um, Paul uh, message which he preached and we know that um, 3,000 of them uh, accepted uh, 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 and received salvation so uh, you know some people from Crete were also among this uh, group of people and they must have been nurtured strengthened in their faith by the apostles and then they as they went back to Crete uh, they would have preached the gospel shared the gospel and uh, you know um, planted uh, churches there so that is how uh, we can say or traditions or um, you know uh, 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 writers say that you know uh, the gospel reached this this island of uh, uh, Crete but the problem here in the churches at Crete was that some Hellenistic Jews um, who were promoting a lot of false teaching false doctrines and making uh, life very difficult for the others and hence uh, Paul saw the need uh, for the truth to be preached there and for leaders, good, uh, able leaders to be selected to put into leadership positions so that they can manage the work at Crete. Uh, okay. So uh, when was this uh, letter basically written? Pro they say probably between 33 to, sorry, 63 to uh, uh, 66 AD. After Paul left Titus at Crete, he went to Macedonia, and then you know that's where he would have heard uh, of about how Titus was doing at Crete, or how the situation at Crete was, or maybe Titus had written a letter to uh, Paul, uh, you know, talking about everything that was happening in Crete. He got a report from him, and hence he, in response to that, he's writing uh, uh, this letter, the same place where he wrote. Uh, first timothy and second timothy to uh timothy who he had left at ephesus um now paul uh, wrote to timothy instructing him to put the you know uh, things that were uh, that you know they he could not complete putting in order because he had to leave crete uh, so he writes to him regarding other matters which needs to be put in order in the churches at crete and then we see that uh, uh, you know, uh, Zenus and Ap Apollos was also mentioned in this Titus, uh, in the book of Titus, you know, uh, 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 other, other two Christian workers who, uh, you know, were about to go to Crete and Paul sends his letter uh, with them uh, to give it to or hand it over to uh, Titus. Okay, so that's briefly uh, introduction to the book of Titus. Anyone has any questions? Any questions?
Okay. Uh, there are no questions, and we'll continue. We'll uh, uh, study uh, chapter one. Uh, now, chapter one, I have kind of done a very detailed exegetical study of uh, each word and phrase. Uh, so I'm just going to be teaching out of this, uh, you know, the, the content which I have written and which I have uh, posted, the PDF copy which I have posted. So it's going to just be exactly from the notes because this is my own personal study. Uh, there's nothing more that I, that I need to uh, add into it. Uh, but it's quite a detailed study and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of content in chapter one we've already looked at in uh, when Paul writes his letter to Timothy where he talks about how to choose elders and bishops and the same thing that he writes. So a little portion of it uh, is going to just be the same that he, he has written to Timothy, which we've already studied, but we will just kind of... Uh, uh, go through it uh, to reiterate our learning and just to uh, help us through okay so we look at uh, chapter one uh, can one of you please read verses one to four please titus chapter one verses one to four titus chapter one one to four paul a servant of god and an apostle of jesus christ to further the faith of god's elect and their knowledge of the truth and that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life which god who does not lie promised before the beginning of time and which now is and which now at and, and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of god our savior to titus my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Say. So in verse 1, Paul is saying that, uh, you know, he's saying, uh, he's mentioning his name first. So while writing his name first, you know, he's basically following the letter writing customs in his day where uh, the name of the uh, the person who's writing the letter is mentioned and then uh, the name of the reader is mentioned and then the, the greetings was given so this is the letter writing customs uh, in 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 those days so uh, we see that you know paul is directly saying it's him who is writing this letter is mentioning it very clearly there and this letter was written to titus uh, it was not just written to Titus, but also written to the believers, the saints um, uh, uh, the, uh, who are part of the church uh, or the churches at uh, the island of Crete. And Paul knew that this letter would be read, uh, you know, publicly before everyone in the churches on the island. Uh, so in the opening uh, structure or the greetings of this letter, you know, Paul uh, takes, uh, you know, great uh, care to write down, uh, to tell the believers at Crete what are his uh, credentials, who he is, um, uh, you know, what is his role, uh, 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 you know, uh, to the churches uh, in the kingdom of God and where he stood on important uh, issues. Now, why is it important uh, for Paul to, you know, mention his credentials? Why do you think it's important for Paul to mention his credentials? Yes, say. Hey? Number one, to differentiate himself from all other false apostles. And then number two, to also provide, um, would I say, validity to whatever he's going to mention afterwards so that they take it seriously and know that he is one speaking as being led by the Spirit of God and commissioned by Jesus Christ as an apostle to speak to the church. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well said. Yes, that's so important because he's writing about very important uh, matters, administration matters, how to choose administrative matters of the church, uh, how to choose elders, what kind of leaders, what to do with false teachers. And imagine 
know, when he's writing all of this and it's going to be read, so people are going to question, now, who is Paul? You know, he's not somebody who established the churches at uh, Crete. Uh, he is not uh, our father that we look up to, you know, uh, and who is he to tell us all of these things? So it's very important for Paul uh, to, you know, to inform the churches or let the believers know who he is so that, you know, when the letter is read, they will know it's from somebody who is in a place of authority, not just vested upon by himself, but, you know, somebody who is in a place of authority and a leadership position because it is a, a, an office that he has been called to by the Lord Jesus Christ himself or by God himself. Elisha says to give some spiritual authority to his writing. Yes, uh, uh, a good credibility credentials to what he is writing. Yes, uh, Divya says that even when Titus is given those instructions for the church, so that there's credibility to whatever he is uh, is being instructed. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so here we see that, you know, uh, Paul is taking time to, you know, uh, write down his uh, credentials to tell them who he really is. And so he says, you know, he begins by saying he's a bond servant. Now, bond servant is the Greek word doulos, which is basically meaning uh, doulos is a slave, uh, but a slave of a very low uh, category, uh, a low, low, very low position. And so, you know, Paul says that he's a bond servant, a slave of God, very important. He's a slave, not of man, not of people, but born servant of God. And so he's saying that even though he is a slave, uh, you know, a slave of very low ranking, uh, but he is made himself as a slave by choice. That means uh, he has chosen uh, uh, to, you know, totally uh, surrender himself to the authority, to the will uh, of uh, God, which means that a, a born servant is somebody who is uh, you know, bonded for life, you know, uh, a slave uh, after seven years is free to go. But, you know, the slave, if they love their master, the master has been good to them, very loyal, and they uh, want to continue serving their master, then uh, they they make this choice. It's their own choice. It's their own will, which they exercise and say they want to become a bond servant. And, uh, you know, they have a mark that is... Um, that they put upon themselves, you know, I think they uh, they uh, have a hair hole made in their hair lobe, and that shows that they are a bond servant, a servant for life uh, to their master. So Paul is saying that he's a bond servant. We already studied about a bond servant uh, when we looked at the book of Romans, I think even in Timothy, you know, uh, so Paul, uh, by choice, he chooses to be a slave who's totally surrendered, uh, to the will and authority of um, God. So even though uh, Paul was a born servant, yet, you know, he had, uh, he was not in a low position, but in a place of, a high place of authority, uh, 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 you know, in a high place of calling, uh, because he was a born servant of God. And it's, you know, a never a low thing uh, to, be identified by the gospel it's never a demeaning thing or a simple thing or a low thing to be uh, a servant of this great god it's uh, a great privilege a great honor to be a servant of this great god and that is what uh, paul is saying and he, along with saying that he's a born servant of god paul says that he's an apostle of jesus uh, christ so he's saying that you know uh, he did not choose this position or this office of being an apostle by his own uh, will or his, uh, you know, he just did not designate this term for himself, designate this office to himself or call upon himself this office. But he says that God gave Paul this particular call and function as an apostle. Now, the Greek word for apostle is apostolos. 
uh, and it means somebody who is a sent one, uh, sent with specific orders, somebody who is a messenger, a commission, somebody who is commissioned to do something, who is an ambassador. And uh, he says that he's been called to this office as an apostle by uh, God himself. So as an apostle, you know, God uh, has called uh, Paul to this office, has given him this authority. Uh, and as a bond servant, uh, we see that Paul is basically pointing out to his personal relationship uh, to God, that he basically, you know, loves God, wants to uh, be under his submission, his control, his will for the rest of his life. Uh, so that is talking about his personal relationship with God. But then when he says that he's an apostle, he, he you know, he's pointing out to his official responsibility uh, uh, within the body of Christ, and also that this official responsibility is given to him by God Himself. So it is uh, uh, Paul is saying that he is Jesus Christ's apostle, and he has been called uh, and equipped and sent forth uh, as an authoritative messenger of Jesus Christ. Because an apostle is somebody who is a sent one, sent with a specific um, order an ambassador, a commissioned one, a messenger. So he says that whatever I'm writing, whatever I'm saying to you, uh, I'm saying it because, you know, uh, uh, it is God himself who has um, given me this message. God himself has commissioned me to say this. God himself has given me, uh, sent me with these orders to give these orders to uh, you. So God has, uh, we, uh, we learn from this that, you know, that God has gifted each one of us different gifts. Uh, you know, our gifts can be uh, to be an apostle, a teacher, a pastor, an evangelist, a missionary. Whatever is our calling, you know, each one of us have different gifts. And God has uh, called us to these different offices. And he enables us uh, uh, or he gives us the grace, the mercy, uh, and the gifts for the mutual edification of the body of Christ. So it's not for us to boast that, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a pastor or an apostle or a prophet or a teacher, but basically these gifts are given, these offices are given to us uh, and puts us in a, in a higher place of responsibility, of a greater place of accountability because we are going to be accountable to God himself uh, because he's entrusted us with this office. And, uh, you know, these offices that we are called to is not just something that we can wear a badge and run around, uh, you know, and claim um, uh, that, you know, uh, claim a place and a position for ourselves, but it's actually for the mutual edification of the body of uh, Christ and ultimately leads to the glory of God. So everything that we do is basically manifesting the glory of God, who God is and what he uh, does. So it's important for us to, you know, recognize, discern uh, the gifts that God has put into our lives, the calling, the functions that he has called us to, uh, the place of ministry that he wants us to minister. And even as he calls us there, he gives us the gifts that are necessary. So we don't compete with each other. We don't, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, we don't uh, think that one is greater than the other. No, all of us are given specific roles, specific gifts, and that is for the mutual edification of the church. Uh, or the body of Christ. And so we use our gifts not to compare, not to compete, not to, uh, you know, get into this rat race of uh, power and position um, and, uh, you know, uh, heights that we can reach, but it is given uh, uh, to us so that we can use it to build up the body of uh, Christ, to build them up, strengthen the body of Christ, the believers, the saints uh, in the uh, faith. So whatever is our gifts, whatever is the offices God has called us to, you know, we must be completely surrendered to his will and his authority, just like Paul uh, just choose to be a born servant of Jesus Christ. And Paul goes on to say, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness. Now, uh, this, uh, you know, there's a lot of writing 
uh, co uh, commentary writers have written about this verse. But you know, just like to look at what the Passion Translation says because it helps us to kind of uh, understand this phrase much better. The Passion Translation says, "I'm writing." Paul is saying, "I'm writing to you to further the faith of God's chosen ones." and lead them to the full knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So basically, I've used this passion translation because it helps us understand this phrase. So Paul is saying, telling Titus, I'm writing to you, telling the believers and the saints in the, at Crete that I'm writing to you to further the faith of God's chosen ones. So he's saying, I'm not just trying to use my uh, you know, authority and power to tell you what to do, what not to do, how you should, you know, conduct yourselves in the church, what kind of leaders, you know, I'm not trying to exercise my authority or my dominion, my position on each one of you, but I'm doing this, uh, you know, I'm writing this to just kind of, you know, build each of you in the faith, further you in the faith and lead you to the full knowledge of the truth uh, and which, you know, both of this, you know, the faith and the full knowledge of the truth will eventually lead to um, godliness. So here Paul is mentioning his mission, uh, which is to further the faith of God's chosen ones, bring them to the knowledge of the truth uh, in that is, uh, will help them in, you know, with godliness or in keeping with godliness. And then he goes on to talk about saying, uh, you know, um, according to the faith of God, select the knowledge, uh, acknowledgement of the truth, uh, which accords with godliness of God's elect. So God's elect are those who God foreknew, uh, you know, even before the foundation of the world, who will choose him, who will reject him, he foreknew, who is going to choose him, who is going to receive his salvation. And those who receive his salvation, you know, they do so by, um, you know, the, the faith that they're exercising their own personal faith, uh, which is empowered, of course, by the Holy Spirit, prompted and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we can't boast that salvation is my own works. You know, it's because of my own faith that I put my faith and trust in God compared to another person who rejected uh, so my faith is much stronger. No, of course, we exercise our personal faith, um, but that personal faith is again prompted and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we can identify who God's elect are uh, and how do we identify them? We identify them by those who have responded positively to the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only responded to the salvation call, but also who people who live by that uh, gospel. And then he says, you know, uh, uh, the gospel which uh, accords, God's elect, which accords with godliness. So here, you know, this phrase accords with godliness is basically, you know, uh, the aim of God's truth is to promote godliness in God's people. So, you know, the truth in God's word. Um, why do we need to read scripture is because it will help us uh, to uh, to be like Christ, to be holy, just like he is holy, to be Christ-like in everything that we do, uh, just basically helps us to be more godly, uh, promotes godliness in God's people. So Paul's ministry and his mission as an apostle is to preach and teach the gospel, uh, which can edify the body of uh, uh, saints, the believers, uh, build them up, uh, build them up in the faith, establish them in the sound faith uh, and in the knowledge of the truth and will also lead them to godliness. So this should be our whole focus of why we want to preach and teach uh, the gospel. Not preach and teach the gospel so that we can show that, you know, hey, I've just uh, completed my three years in Bible college or I studied so much, so I just want to, you know, <laughs> Uh, share everything that I, I have learned or not preaching it in a sense where, you know, I know everything and I stand in a better place than you. So preaching down on people, no. Uh, it's also not preaching to get uh, fame or let people know who you are or, uh, you know, um, to have a great uh, following on YouTube, uh, you know, how many likes, how many dislikes. Uh, that should not be our criteria. 
But our criteria is that, you know, we teach so that we can build the saints or the believers uh, uh, in the sound faith, uh, in the knowledge of the truth, which will ultimately lead them to godliness. So all of us, you know, are being built up or being edified or being uh, coming to, or coming to that place where we are this uh, this bride just prepared for the uh, bride group. So that should be our mission, our purpose for the church today. Why we need to preach and teach the gospel uh, it is to promote growth and development of mature faith in God's chosen ones, that is his believers, the saints in the church, and uh, through growth in the knowledge of the truth and then reaching uh, godliness or becoming more Christ-like. Okay? Verse 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised uh, before time, Began. So Paul states that his ministry, his apostleship uh, is in the interest of, you know, the faith of God's chosen ones. Uh, it's in the interest of them uh, knowing the truth and promoting godliness, uh, you know, which rests on this hope of eternal life. So see how beautifully he's just connecting, you know, his credentials of who he is and the purpose of why he is writing and also why he is doing ministry, why he is preaching and teaching is so that people can be built up in the faith, uh, they can come to the knowledge of the truth and you know this can promote godliness uh, with the hope of eternal life. Now this hope, word hope here is not something that is just you know wishing that something will happen or it will come true but the Greek word for hope here I've written the I put the Greek word there, you know, uh, it basically means, you know, a confident expectation and anticipation. So it is basically a confident uh, expectation uh, because, uh, you know, of this, this hope of eternal life, because it rests on the promises of God. And it says that, you know, promises of God who cannot lie uh, and God cannot lie. Um, because he's perfect, his character is holy, uh, and hence our promise of eternal life, this hope of eternal life, uh, it, it is on a sure foundation that is the promises of God, and, and God's promises stand from eternity to eternity, from generation to generation, because he's a God who cannot lie, because he's a God by nature who is holy and uh, perfect. Now, eternal life is not something like I've explained before. It's not something that we will, you know, have this hope that we are going to have this eternal life somewhere in the future. Uh, someday we'll possess this eternal life. It's not just uh, an eschatological hope. Eschatology means somewhere uh, hope far into the future, a confident expectation, anticipation of something that we will enjoy in the future. But it's a realized eschatology, which means that we can realize eternal life here and now. The minute you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have received him into your life, you can experience that fullness of eternal life. You can possess the fullness of eternal life here now in the in the present. Uh, but yet, you know, the, the completeness of it in the fullest form can be seen in a later uh, time when we see, when we are with God, we see him face to face, you know, that's when we will uh, fully experience eternal life. But we already are experiencing eternal life here and now, the minute that we are born again. And how do we know this? Scripture says this in John chapter 3, verse 36. It tells us that those who believe in the Son uh, has eternal life. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. That is, possesses uh, eternal life. So the word possesses is better than has. It's not something that says the one who believes in the Son will have uh, or may have, but it says has, which means it's already a realized thing. It's something that is present now, you know, so we can possess that eternal life here and now and uh, you know we can experience it here in the fullest sense and also says you know who god cannot lie so the apostle is pointing out uh, two points here the reality of the truth of god and the eternal nature of his uh, promises 
so the reality of the truth of God is God cannot lie, which the Greek word for lie here means free from falsehood uh, or as not guilty of falsehood. Or the other meaning is truthful. So we see that God is, uh, you know, cannot speak anything that is lies. Is free from falsehood. He is utterly truthful. And so the literal meaning here is God who is free from all the feet of falsehood and hence is truthful, is trustworthy. Uh, so, you know, that is the reality of the truth of God and also his eternal nature of his promises. Uh, because he's a God who cannot lie, his promises are sure and he is will be faithful to for, for perform his promises. So it's wonderful to know that our eternal life, you know, rests on the truth of the nature of God, who is a God who cannot lie, who is utterly honest, truthful, pure and holy, and also that his promises are, you know, uh, eternal in nature because he's a God who cannot <clears throat> lie. Okay, we'll stop here, we'll go for a break and then, um, sorry, we'll, I'll meet you at uh, 11.01, okay? We'll go for a break. Thank you, everyone. And then if we come, when we come back after break, if you have any questions, I'll answer those questions. Thank you. <clears throat>